Let's jump in Hebrews chapter 12. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We've been uh, sitting most of the time here, so let's get our legs stretched. Let's look at verse 1. Before we read verse 1, let me just remind you, Jared, if you could turn my uh, wireless on, that'd be great. Let me just remind you that this cloud of witnesses are those mentioned prior in Hebrews chapter 11 and other great saints who have joined them. So keep that in mind, that those who struggled through life and, uh, and lived by faith, they're cheering us on from the grandstands of heaven. Look at verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we, are all, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience, with patience, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author, and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Let's pray. As we, Lord, continue the sermon from this morning and are reminded of our forefathers and God, the faith that they lived by, Um, the... um, the failures that many of them had, some of them major failures, but Lord, how they got up, they dusted themselves off, and they finished strong. Lord, we're thankful for that. And Lord, as we continue this thought of looking back at our forefathers, I pray we would be encouraged to take the baton from them and to run our race as strong as we can and then prepare the next generation to to take the baton from us and continue on Uh, this rich heritage that goes back thousands of years. May we do our part to continue that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So this morning we looked at their faith. We talked about how faith is trusting, relying on God's ability to do the impossible. We looked at several instances where God stepped up and did what mankind cannot do. Cannot do. Uh, foresee the future and weave those into events, impregnate ladies whose wombs were barren and see them get pregnant in some cases in their old age and, and others just a barren womb and the Red Sea parted. Some incredible things. We talk about how that faith is the ability to trust God or re, uh, it's, it's, it's trusting in God to do the impossible. But then we looked at our action, how that we must be willing to do what is possible. We've got to be willing to do what is possible. How many of you believe that when Jesus saves someone's soul from hell, that that is a miracle? Raise your hand. How many understand that unless we go out and tell other people about Jesus saving grace, there's a good chance he's not going to save many of those souls. You've got to do the possible so that he can do the impossible. Those of you that go out on uh, uh, Sunday afternoons and go to the nursing home, you're doing the possible so God can do the impossible. Those of you that show up on a Tuesday evening and go out and uh, pass out uh, 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 tracks or door hangers or uh, go and invite someone who visited our church or uh, maybe follow up with someone in the uh, hospital, God can work a miracle of grace in their life and do the impossible because you're willing to do the possible. Those of you that stand up for, for the Lord at work and you, uh, you're not ashamed of your faith at work, God can do the impossible in their lives because you are, are doing the possible and He's doing the impossible through you doing the possible. So we looked at their faith, how that there were two elements to that. We talked about their failures, how that they messed up, they blew it at times, they were sidelined, they had the flat tire on the side of the road, but instead of just quitting... They didn't do that. They worked hard. They maintained. They went forward, and, uh, and they got up. Number three, we looked at their finish. Let's continue on this afternoon and look at number four, our foundation, our foundation. Let me give you an A and a B here. First notice their struggles, their struggles. Now, i got to tell you, we've got it made in the shade. We live in 2018, about... 50 feet behind most of you is my office, and on my shelves in my office sit several different commentaries. Those commentaries are 
long explanations of what the Bible says. Not only do we have a completed Bible, we have had hundreds of years, thousands of years now, to figure out what it means. Wow. We don't really have to struggle to know what our faith ought to be, do we? But do you know that these forefathers, they weren't so lucky. They weren't so blessed. And so we know that they had struggles because they didn't have a Bible to tell them right or wrong. What would your life look like if the Bible ceased to exist or had never existed? That's where they were. That's where they were. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And if you understand 1 Corinthians 13, that part of it, it's talking about the fact that the Bible was not completed. It was like they were looking into a glass or a mirror darkly, darkly. You ever tried to, uh, guys, you ever tried to brush your hair and get a part in your hair when you didn't have the proper lighting? You ever try to do that? Ladies, you ever try to put makeup on in the dark? You come out looking like, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm thinking, right? Um, but I'm not going to say it. Um, you know, that's what it was like. They struggled. They struggled to know what was right. They struggled to do right. They didn't have a Bible. And then we know that uh, they struggled with getting a Bible, with getting a Bible. After God had given John the last verse in Revelation and it had been penned, they began to work to compile the, the canon of Scripture and get it there. And then they got it all there. And then uh, uh, before you knew it, it, it was in the Latin tongue or the Greek tongue and the Catholic Church and I'm not being mean to the Catholic Church, it's just history, they would not let the Bible be translated into the common man's tongue. You'd go to church and some priest would stand there and read the Bible to you in Latin and you had no idea what they were saying. And they would say, oh, you don't need a copy of the Bible in your language because we can tell you what it means. And oh, the dark ages. Oh, the corruption. Do you want to know where humanity goes when you take the Bible from the people? Look back at the Renaissance era. Look back at the Middle Ages and look and see how barbaric it was. See how dark it was. See how awful it was. See how uneducated people were. That's where societies go when you suck morality out and you leave people to fend for themselves. We need a Bible to tell us what was right and wrong. So when I talk about our forefathers and their struggles, please, please, please do not take for granted the Bible that sits in your lap, the Bible that you have digitally on your phone or tablet, uh, the Bible that, uh, that you hold. I've got several Bibles that I own. Some I keep at home. Some I keep here at the church. I've got a lot of Bibles and I tell you, you get used to it. You walk in the door from church and you just toss it down like that on your coffee table and it can just sit there and collect dust until you pick it up and go back to church and you can forget about it. You can begin to take it for granted. Oh, precious book divine, you're the one for me. We've got to value this. You know why? Because people gave their lives so that you could have a copy of this in the English language. William Tyndale was called a heretic, a lunatic. He was ostracized from the church. He worked hard to translate the Bible into the common uh, man's language into English. And then what happened was they took him, they tied him to a stake, they killed him, and they burnt his body because he worked to provide a copy of the Bible in the English language to folks today. And the King James translators took his work. And much of what we have today was the work of William Tyndale, Tyndale who said, I'm going to struggle and I'm going to give up my own life in order to make the Bible available to the English-speaking people. And that same story can be told about many, many other men who did so for other languages as well. In fact, there are those today who are struggling to make the Bible possible in other languages that are still without a copy of the Bible. And they risk life and limb to do it. And I've got to say today that we have a foundation where men and women struggled. They struggled to know how to 
do what was right without a Bible. They struggled in order to get a Bible so we could understand it. And I have to tell you that there has been a struggle as well to establish sound doctrine. To establish sound doctrine. One thing has become clear to me as I have studied uh, the Pauline epistles, the letters written by Paul that we've been covering on Wednesday nights in church. And this is what's become very obvious to me is that almost every church that Paul wrote to, he wrote to them primarily to address false doctrine that was working its way into those churches. Over and over and over again, he addresses false doctrine doctrines that were seeping into the church. And you say, well, pastor, surely we've gotten around that. And I got to tell you, no, we haven't. How many religious institutions are there in Stratford? A dozen? Two dozen? How many different religious institutions had a service today? Do you know that 95% of them did not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ today? They met, they had their little religious meeting, they uh, packed up and they went home and they left empty inside because Jesus Christ has not saved hardly any of them in there because the gospel is just not ever preached there. Why? Because Satan has gotten sound doctrine into the church. But this was even more so the case back then where sound doctrine was under attack and they had to stand up for it. And we come to church and we put our Bible under our arm and we walk in and we sit down and we open the Bible and we yawn our way through a sermon and we check our watch and we want to know when the preacher's going to be done because we've got other things to do and we take for granted that this church teaches and preaches the Bible exactly the way it's written. We assume that it's always been that way and we forget that churches for centuries struggled to get their doctrine right. We forget that churches for centuries didn't even have a Bible. We forget that for centuries churches would fight to get one page of a Bible and they would pass it around to the various members of the church to read it in risk of of being killed for their faith. We forget that men and women fought in order to translate the Bible. We forget that people struggle to live a godly life without even having a Bible. And i got to tell you today, as we remember our forefathers, we must remember our foundation. We must remember their struggle in order to get the foundation. How many of you here have ever built a house or a building from the ground up or paid to have that done? How many of you know that getting the foundation right is key to having a solid home? You don't have a good foundation. It doesn't matter how pretty the refrigerator is. It doesn't matter how well the cabinetry is hung in the kitchen. It doesn't matter what the bathroom vanity looks like. If that foundation's messed up, you're going to have problems the entire time that structure's up. And listen, to get the foundation that this church doctrinally is built on, boy, it was a struggle to get it. And it's here. And we need to stop occasionally and look at the foundation and say, thank you, Lord, for the foundation that we have. We, as we talk about our foundation, we also must focus on the cornerstone of the foundation, and that is letter B, the, their Savior, their Savior. You see, Jesus didn't just save people after He came and died. Jesus was in the saving business going all the way back to Job. You know what's fascinating about Job. Job looks at his friends, and one of the things he says is, I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. He, he, the, 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 autobi- or the biography of his life was the first book of the Bible. There wasn't a page of the Bible around. But he knew, he knew that his Redeemer was in heaven, and that he was living, and that he was going to come. And save him. You say, well, pastor, how did people get saved back before Jesus came? They got saved the same way we do. They had faith. They had faith in a coming Messiah or a Christ who would uh, uh, be the sacrifice for their sins. Romans 4.16 uh, says this, Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise uh, must be uh, uh, made, uh, uh, must be sure to all the seed, not only that, uh, not to that only which is of the law, but that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. How did our forefathers like Abraham get saved? Faith. Faith. And so, who is the cornerstone? Who is the cornerstone of the foundation of what we believe in who we are? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 tells us this very thing. Ephesians 2.19 says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief 
cornerstone, and whom also the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Let's look at letter C, our stewardship. So we talked about their struggles. We talked about their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's talk about our stewardship. Can you turn over to Luke chapter 12 with me? Luke chapter 12. Look at verse 42. And I'm going to jump right to the middle of the verse here. Look here. You can pick up, you can figure out where I'm at as we read along here. For unto whomsoever much is given. Can we read the rest of the verse together? Of him shall be much required. Let's do that again. For unto whomsoever much is given. Read it out loud. Of him shall much be required. Shall be much required. Excuse me. Luke 12, 42. Is that not the right place? Should be in the middle of the verse. All right, I might have given you the wrong reference. I'm sorry. All right, you all know the verse, too much is given, much should be required. Okay, we're going to run with that. You know, one of the things that drives me nuts is when you give somebody something really, really precious and they don't take care of it. Can't stand it. Can't stand it. You give a child a $130 pair of gym shoes and they walk through the mud with them. What are you doing? They don't care. They don't value them. They don't value them. You give a 13-year-old girl a purity ring, you drop big money on it at the jewelry store, and she loses it the second week you give it to her. That ring cost me whatever, $800, $1,000. Do you not even, they don't value it. Here's what I'm getting at here. We did not have to struggle to get the foundation. We didn't have to struggle on the cross to be the cornerstone of the foundation. By the time you and I came on the scene, our forefathers had struggled. They had watched Jesus die on the cross, some of them. They had been form a uh, uh, fit together into a foundation and they had worked to build it up and then the keys to this building the church are handed to our generation and we're told it's already been put together it's already been taken care of here it's your turn to steward uh, the, the the church it's your turn and I'm sorry to say this but many 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 people who play church they're not taking care of this foundation. They're not taking care of this building. They're trampling all over it. They're walking all over. And I got to say that this church is not the building. It's not the pews. It's not the lights and the windows. This church is the body of Christ and the Bible that we hold to, which is our creed. It is the doctrines that it teaches. And it is us who are, 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 are fit together in Christ. And we are to steward that. We're to take care of it. We're to protect it. We're to value it. We're to take the baton from our forefathers and we're to pass it on to the next generation and say we valued it we took care of it we watched over it now it's your turn unfortunately today many christians are not stewarding this very well one of the things that i can't stand is when i meet someone out and i don't i don't tell them i can't stand it but it, it eats at me inside i meet someone out and about who claims to be saved and they say well i don't need to go to church church is not for me Well, you don't know the Bible if you say church is not for you. Church was not invented by man. Church was invented for man by God. Don't you throw stones at the church. Don't you criticize the church. Don't you sit back and say, "Uh, I'll be better off at home uh, doing my own thing. No, no, no. God knew that you needed the church. He knew what it was going to do for you. He knew it was going to help you. You get in and you get involved. Anybody can throw stones. It takes someone to step up and say, I may not like this about my church, but I'm going to get in, I'm going to get elbow deep, and I'm going to do my part to help make my church the best place it can be so I can hand it to the next generation. Let me move on here. Number five, notice the fight. The fight. So we've looked at uh, we've looked at number one, their faith. Number two, their failures. Number three, their finish. Number four, our foundation. Number five, the fight. 
the fight. Look back at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, if you could with me. Do we have any runners in the room or any past runners, people who've had some running experience in their life? Okay? A few of you in here? How many of you know that there is some fight involved in being a long-distance runner? You're fighting your own, really you're fighting yourself, aren't you? Uh, To beat your previous time, to keep going when you're wore out. I watch people run a 26-mile marathon. I don't know how they do it. Uh, All I can say is they're able to keep going when their body says to quit. They know how to fight. It's like a boxer in a ring in the 12th round and the person on the, on the other side is their own flesh. And it is the mind and the will against the flesh. And they know how to keep on going. They know how to endure. And i got to tell you that sometimes life is kicking us in the mouth. And our flesh is trying to get us to back down off what we know to do is right. And to start doing what's wrong. To pick up the language of the past. To pick up the habits of the past. To pick up the TV habits of the past. uh, To pick up the sin habits of the past. And our flesh is fighting our will to do right. The Bible says the flesh is willing, but the spirit is weak. And we've got to learn how to make that spirit strong to put down the flesh and there is a fight look here Hebrews 12 1 wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let the picture be painted in your mind here there you are in the middle of a grueling race and up in the grandstands are all of our forefathers and they're cheering us on they had their turn to run life's race and they finished they fell along the way they got up and dusted themselves off they finished their race they're now in the grandstands of heaven and they're cheering you want. The Bible gives us now, the Bible is going to give us some advice on how to run the race. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And hey, he's saying here, uh, uh, we're being told here that if you're going to fight the good fight, if you're going to finish your race, then you're going to have to take away the weights called sin. You're going to have to take away the weights that be so easily beset you, and you're going to have to run the race. Uh, we must, let her A, battle against the deeds of the flesh. We've got to battle against the deeds of the flesh. The body does not want you to do its right. How many of you know what it's like to wake up on a Sunday morning and be like, Church ain't happening today. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I know what I'm talking about. I'm the pastor. Okay? And um, I woke up this morning, and I was uh, putting on uh, my um, um, old-fashioned uh, sort of clothes, and my, my wife said to me, and she's up early, and she's perky, she says to me, are you awake? And I said, no. And about 10 seconds later, are you awake? So I just ignored her. And about 10 seconds later, are you awake? And I said, stop asking me if I'm awake. I said, I want to go back to bed. You know, you go hard all week at work. And the devil wants to tell you, Sunday is your day. Just stay home and rest. But Sunday is not your day, my friend. Sunday is the Lord's day. You're to get up and go to church. You give that day to him. You're to be there. It's a battle against the deeds of the flesh. And we could go on and elaborate with that, but if you're going to value and steward the foundation that's been given to us by the forefathers, you must fight the flesh to do it. Let her be. We must battle against the devil. We must battle against the devil. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Satan is looking to drop you. Ephesians 6 describes him as uh, a warrior with fiery darts, looking to shoot you in the weakness of your uh, time, or your armor's not on just right. He's looking to drop you. He wants to make fun of you. He wants to put your proverbial head on his wall as a trophy, and he is fighting you. He's fighting the church's doctrine. He's fighting the church's growth. He's fighting. Listen, we have days where we're pushing. I got to tell you, friend day, we faced a lot 
of adversity on Friend Day. We were, uh, our church saw uh, a lot of things that were behind the scenes that just went wrong leading up to Friend Day. And I know I invited a lot of people and none of them came. And there were some attacks on social media against the church. And there were all kinds of things going on that were just not uh, positive. And, and I had a hard time getting my spirit up for that day. You say, well, Pastor, why were we so opposed? Because we're preaching the eternal truth of salvation and Satan wants to oppose it at every turn. Well, we got to fight. The devil can fight back, but we got to take the punch and stand and say, the Lord is on our side. What can man do unto me? Battle against the devil. We've been given this foundation by our forefathers. We've been given this foundation by the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only do we have to battle our flesh, we've got to battle the devil and let her see we've got to battle against doubt. We've got to battle against doubt. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. It says there, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently, diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. Um, you ever have Satan whisper seeds of, whisper doubt your way, or you feel doubt come your way? And is going to church even making a difference anyway? I mean, my family doesn't really change much, and, you know, my children are really grown in the Lord, and if it is, it feels minimal, you tell yourself. And, you know, I pray, but does God even hear my prayer? Because, you know, I'm still just as sad. Life's still just as hard. I read my Bible, but, you know, I don't really see any difference. And, and Satan can whisper these uh, doubts in our ears, and God says, hey, listen, listen, run your race with patience. It is a process. Run your race with patience and, and, and continue forward. Uh, we have some friends here uh, that are visiting today, Kay and Kermit, uh, Kermit and Kay, and then Butch and Betty. And uh, we, we haven't seen you guys have much of a conversation with you in two years. You know, one of the, one of the first things they said to uh, me when they saw us was, did you put your kids in a stretcher machine? And I thought, what? Oh, you mean have they grown? They've really grown. You know what? They haven't seen my kids for two years. So to them, my kids look like, whoa. But we see it every day. So we don't notice. You keep walking with God. The growth may be slow, but it's there. Church may not make a drastic impact all at once, but you keep coming because it will be there. And you'll have times in your life where you hit a spiritual growth spurt and you grow real fast. You have other times in your life where you're trying and you may be growing a little bit slower and you can't look at the short term and be short-sighted and throw in the towel and quit. No, no, no. you got to fight the devil. you got to fight the deeds of the flesh. And you got to fight doubt. And you got to walk in faith. Number six, and lastly, notice the focus. So we've looked at all these things today about our forefathers, their faith, their failures, their finish. We looked at the the foundation. We looked at the fight. Let's finish up here, number six, with the focus. What is the focus? The focus is to be on our calling. You know, God's called you to some things if you're saved. Ephesians 2, 9 says he's called you into good works. He's called you into good works. Um, Uh, We've been called to live uh, under submission of the Holy Spirit, and so we've got to focus on those things and do those things. Let her be noticed, we must focus on his uh, capability. We must focus on his capability. You know, I've learned that if I'll just do my part, God's pretty good at doing his. I got to do my part. I got to do my part. And if I'll do my part and I'll stay focused, then that will, uh, then, then he can do great and mighty things. Let me finish with a quote. Ready? This morning I gave you a big, long, elaborate quote from Teddy Roosevelt. This afternoon I'm going to give you a really short quote. And I don't know who to attribute it to, but it's really good. Okay? Talking about our focus. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Now that may sound simple, but it's profound. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Satan wants you to go in a hundred different directions. Jesus wants you to focus on the main thing. And he wants you to keep it the main thing. Are you doing the basics of the Christian life? Are you pressing to grow? Then you leave the rest 
up to God. On a personal note, I think anyone here that knows me very well knows one thing about me. I love my family, and I love White Oak Baptist Church. Those two things define me solely. I love Angela Matthew and April, and I love White Oak Baptist Church. I give 90, 98% of my time to my family and White Oak Baptist Church. Do you know what I want more than anything? I want my family to walk with God, be a godly family. And I want White Oak Baptist Church, the members, to grow and feel loved. And I want the, the membership base to grow. And sometimes I can want it so bad that when things don't go at my expectations, I get frustrated. Why, aren't, why isn't this family becoming more consistent to church? Why is this person still struggling with that sin when I have prayed with him and met with him over and over and over again? Why aren't more people visiting and sticking? And I can get frustrated. And God has to come back and remind me regularly, Richard, your job is not to grow White Oak Baptist Church. Your job is to love them and be their shepherd, their under-shepherd. My job is to change them and grow the church. You keep the main thing the main thing, and I'm plenty of capable of growing the church at the speed I think it needs to grow and helping the families along at the speed I think they need to be helped along. You do the main thing, and I'll do what I'm capable of. How about it today? Are you focused on the road ahead? Hey, look, it's fine. We did this today. It's fine to look backwards at our forefathers and learn many things from them. That's what a lot of the Bible's about. But we must take our eyes off the rearview mirror. We must look out the windshield and we must steer the car to accomplish our calling and trust God that He is the engine, the power in the engine that makes it go. Are you focused on the main things? Let's keep our heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment here. Lord, I pray, God, that you would move in our heart. Help us to remember how blessed we are. The foundation that's been given to us, the struggle to get that foundation, the Savior who died to be the cornerstone of that foundation, and God, the, uh, the, the, the stewardship we've been given of it. I pray, God, that we would fight the good fight of faith. May we fight the flesh. May we fight the devil. May we fight the doubt that Satan wants us to buy into. And Lord, may we focus on those things in front of us that matter. God, I pray that we would value the Bible, value sound doctrine, value our church family. And Lord, may we do our part to, to move all of these things forward for you. Help us, Lord, to keep the main thing, the main thing. Thank you for uh, a church family and what a wonderful time we've had today. Be with us during this time of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. The piano's playing. And I would encourage you, if you'd like to come and kneel and talk to the Lord and